So serious games are basically using video game design approaches and video game technologies with the goals of improving education and training. So in addition to being entertaining, we, wanted to have, we have a very serious goal with using serious games. And I've been involved in this field for quite a while. It's actually about 17 years, so I'm kind of a dinosaur when it comes to serious games. And I've mostly done serious games in the area of healthcare. And it's a very exciting field, and more and more people are catching on to this and seeing that if we make boring things fun, we can get people to do the right things. But as you can tell, I'm a little bit older. I'm not of the video game gen generation. So how did it all start? Let me just tell you a, a quick story. Um, when I was a little kid, I used to love to draw and paint, and I loved reading about artists, and my parents encouraged me in that. And so I was growing up, I was always involved in art, and then when I was 13 years old, I had to meet with a principal to decide what classes I was gonna take for the rest of my high school years. And uh, I went into the office and I said very confidently and proudly that I wanted to take art classes every semester until I graduated. And she was quite taken aback by my statement and she said, whoa, um, you know, we only let stupid kids take art every year. And that's how I remember it. She probably used a different word. And she also said, if you take art classes every semester, you're not gonna get into college. So I was also taken aback by what she said because I thought to myself, wow, I didn't know I should have been embarrassed because I wanted to be an artist. And, um, you know, and my dad, he grew up in Japan and went to college there. He doesn't know the American system of getting into college, so he's been encouraging me, not knowing that I might not get into college if I study art, and my mom, she never went to college, so she's been encouraging me, so she doesn't know either that that's not the right thing to do. So I put it aside, and that's all to say that that was a very, that one conversation, making decisions about my future, happened very quickly, but it had an influence on my life. But the good news is, I'm always, I've always been an artist at heart, and I have a deep appreciation for what visual images can do and how they encompass our whole emotion and life and they're much bigger things than thoughts can be. And let me show you how that showed up in my life later on. So um, as I started to get into graduate school, I was a PhD student in psychology at Stanford and I was really interested in, you know, how do we usually teach people? So we either teach people by giving them information, and it's usually in textual form, or we tell them, okay, and we expect them to understand us and to do the things that we want to do. But if, I, if you read this word fun, what are you thinking? And when I tell you, when I talk about fun, what do I mean? How effective is that in communicating as opposed to if I showed you an image of what fun means to me? Now I have these four images up here. For me, Fun, sometimes it's playing video games, but other times it's riding horses. And for you, the image of fun might be something different. But if we exchange those images, we can come to a better understanding. And it's not just that word and what it means in our brain, but it's how it makes us feel, what we're doing out in the world. So it encompasses a lot more than just the thought. I took that a bit further. In the beginning of my graduate studies, I was doing a lot of interviews in pediatric oncology, so in the clinics where we treat young people with cancer. And I would ask them how they thought about having their cancer. But I couldn't do these interviews with really young kids, three and four year olds that are pre-verbal, but a lot of these kids get cancer. And they obviously didn't enjoy having cancer, they didn't enjoy being sick, and I could hear them screaming when they're getting shots, they didn't enjoy the treatments they got but they seemed to be pretty well adjusted. So I was wondering what was going on. You know, do these kids feel bad about having cancer? Are they reflective about it at all? So I wanted to talk with them about it. So what I did was I talked with them about, you know, do they think that they're bad because they're sick or do they think that any of the treatments that they're getting, they're getting because they did something wrong. And I was inspired by the work of Jean Piaget, who's a very famous developmental psychologist who was also interested in moral development. So how do kids grow up thinking about what's right, what's wrong, and coming to make decisions about that in their life? And uh, when he, the way that he learned about psychology and about development was he would interview kids and he would talk to them. And when he interviewed really young kids, he would say, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And they would just basically give kind of nonsense answers to him, repeating the question or re 
or answering in some other odd way that he couldn't make a lot of sense of. Um, and then sometimes they would develop into this theory that there's imminent justice in the world. So that when you do something bad, bad things happen to you. And you can imagine, even as adults, we often think that as well. So I was curious as to how these young children in the clinic thought about it. So what I did was I drew a bunch of pictures of kids doing something naughty, like stealing their cookies from their brother, um, punishment, having to go to bed without your dessert. I also drew a lot of pictures of illness scenarios, like a kid has bumps on their body, or treatment, having to go to the hospital. And so what I could do was I could talk to kids about whether or not they thought they were sick or getting treated because they were bad. So I would show them a picture of a kid who was naughty, who stole something, and a kid who was sick, who had bumps on her body. And I would say, one of these kids is naughty. Which one is naughty? And I showed them a bunch of these scenarios and to a lot of kids, hundreds of kids, and I went back and I analyzed the data statistically. So I could see if they were clearly telling me that they could differentiate the concepts or if they were just performing at chance, which is what Piaget would have said they would do. They're just kind of responding randomly. Uh, and I did this also as well for punishment treatments to see if they confuse those concepts. And what I found through the power of images and talking to kids this way was that they clearly knew that when you were sick, you were not bad, and when you were getting treatment, it wasn't as a punishment. So I was able to get at some very sophisticated and impressive reasoning from these young kids that I couldn't have gotten if I had just talked to them and asked them for an answer to give me an answer. And that really inspired me and showed me what visual images can do in terms of communication and understanding. Now, that all led into a much more sophisticated project that I worked on next. And as you might ima imagine, cancer is a topic that not a lot of people enjoy talking about, especially if you're a teenager with cancer. Now, a lot of young kids get cancer and old kids get cancer. Not so many teenagers get it, but when they do get it, it's quite an aggressive disease. And my colleague, Archie Blyer, in the United States, he's a pediatric oncologist, he took a look at our cancer registry there. So all the people who get cancer in the U.S., information about their tumor, their treatments, how long they live is in that database. He looked at it after the 70s, over 20, 25 years, and he keeps updating it. But he looked at improvements in survival outcomes with new cancer therapies. And what he found was that very young kids were showing really nice improvements in survival outcomes. And older people above the age of 50 were doing really nicely in terms of improving their survival outcomes. But there was a gap in between, especially with adolescents and young adults, where they're experiencing only minimal improvements in survival and, um, and, there, and or no improvement at all. And that can be caused by the aggressiveness of the tumors that they have and also in the U.S. at that time, access to health care. And those weren't factors that we could change. But one thing we did know was that teenagers don't like doing what they're told. Um, th there was also some evidence that they're not quite uh, complying with their medication regimes at this time. So when you think about if you're a teenager, you don't like to do what you're told and you're very present focused. So if you have to stay in and study for a test because you'll get into a good college, you'll make good grades, and you'll get a good job later on in life, you would rather go to a party that night because that's just much more fun than studying. And the same thing with taking chemotherapy. If I have to take a chemotherapy pill as a teenager, I take the pill, and what happens? Okay, my hair falls out. My face blows up so you can't recognize me. I'm throwing up all the time. I get really bad diarrhea or really bad constipation, which is very uncomfortable and embarrassing. And I get sick all the time because the chemotherapy kills my immune system along with the rapidly dividing cancer cells. That's not much fun. So what can we do to change the scenario of I take pills and I'm good, and when I forget to take my pills or I don't want to take them, I'm a bad person? Well, Pam Amidiar and I co-founded Hope Lab, and we made a video game. And let me just show you what it looked like. OK, so you're Roxy. You travel through the body with your pal Smitty. You deal with fighting side effects of cancer. This is a seizure she's helping to manage. She's surfing on throw up here. Um, she's fighting infections, and she's go, so taking antibiotics is a lot like taking chemotherapy.
chemotherapy, you have to keep taking it, and she's doing experimental cancer therapy. So we weren't very preachy in this film. We took them through the body and showed them how cancer worked. And they got this impression that when I go into a lymph node, I shoot the cancers, I go into the next lymph node to fight cancer again. I might get a message that said, you left a few cancer cells behind and the colony regrew, you have to go back and shoot the, shoot the cancer cells again. So they get this idea that I have to kill every last cancer cell in my body with chemotherapy. And if I don't get every last one, it's gonna come back. So I get the insight that I have to take my chemotherapy and it's really important. And we actually evaluated this game just like you do a, a medication. So we did a randomized control trial, randomly assigned people to play the game or an Indiana Jones game where you also go to different places and fight enemies. And what we found was that not only did these kids improve their knowledge of cancer and increase their confidence in managing the cancer and side effects, but they also took their medication more. How do we know that? We gave them their antibiotics in a special bottle with a computer chip on top that recorded the date and time they opened and closed it. We could compare it to doctor records. And we found that the kids who played remission took their antibiotics more frequently and as directly than the kids in the control group. And that's a pretty big deal because a lot of people with cancer, not just kids with cancer, die of infections because the chemotherapy kills your healthy immune cells as well, so you can't fight illnesses off so well. So that is a behavior related to increased survival. The other thing we did was, in addition to asking kids how much they were taking their medication, we took samples of their blood before they got the games, one month later and three months later. And what we found was that, you know, the kids who played remission, their chemotherapy metabolites in their blood remained constant and high, and the kids in the control group, the chemotherapy in their blood went down over time. And that's usually what you see when people have to follow a complicated medical regime. So what this showed was that a video game can actually intervene in the process of having an illness, get you to learn about things, and have a very profound and meaningful impact on behaviors in the long term. So in short, a video game could actually save your life. Um, I'd actually like to just show you this short video. So we actually may have been one of the first video games to address poop in your body. So like I mentioned before, constipation is actually a big problem with these kids. And before we made this game, we went to the nurses and said, what's something that's something that kids need to talk about in terms of their health, but they're embarrassed to talk about it and be something we could address in the game. And they all agreed they said constipation because kids are embarrassed to tell people they have this problem. Then it gets to be a big problem. They have to go to the hospital. Their whole body gets cleared out by this medication called Go Lightly. The whole staff knows they were constipated. The whole family knows they're constipated, and it's really embarrassing. So we had this portion in the game where Roxy had to go in and fight stool jags to prevent infections and get the patient to take stool softener. And we found that this part of the game had the most impact on their knowledge and also knowing how to manage constipation. So what this told me was that if we use an interactive, immersive situation where you interact, we're not preachy, we don't tell you exactly what you want to do, you have to fight cancer, get the patient to take stool softener, um, and it's a very stigmatizing thought to have constipation, but we dealt with it with humor and with a narrative. So we could deal with very stigmatizing and embarrassing topics in a video game better than we can if we just talk about it and tell you what you have to do. So, so what's the next thing, what's the next way that we can push the limits? And something that's become a big crisis in healthcare is taking care of our aging population. You know, m technical advances have gone so far, we're helping people live really long lives, but what's happening is we're living these long lives dealing with chronic illnesses. And these are illnesses that can't take, be taken care of directly in the hospital. When you leave the hospital, you have to manage your health. You have to change your diet. You have to go out and exercise more. You have to remember to take your medication that sometimes doesn't feel so good. And sometimes you also have to give yourself your own shots. And if you do that well, you can be healthy. Um, but this is not something that's directly given to you. The other thing that's happening with the aging population is that it's 
causing a, it's a big cost to the healthcare system. So some estimates are between 30 to 50 percent of the cost of healthcare are spent in the last year of our life, and even the most it goes up very sharply in the last month of life. But they've taken a closer look at this last year, and when they do these these medical interventions, often very dramatic. Um, they don't improve your quality of life. In fact, they make your quality of life worse. So it seems like we're making the wrong decisions at the end of our life, or decisions that aren't making us happy and aren't exactly what we want. So what if, instead of having to talk to our doctor exactly about what we want, stating it, writing it down, or a doctor having to talk to us, because doctors actually report they find it very difficult to have these conversations as well, we didn't have to talk about these traumatic things like resuscitating someone at the end of life when it's just going to break their ribs and give them bruises and they're going to die within a few months. How can we talk about end of life planning in a way that's fun? And I think we can take cutting edge technologies like augmented reality, virtual reality, and combine it with video game approaches to talk about situations that we might face that are scary, that we don't want to think about, that make us uncomfortable, and make better decisions and learn more about them, have more informed decisions in ways that we're relaxed in thinking about them, dealing with them, and they actually might even be fun. And this doesn't have to do with just end of life. This is also how we can live every day of our life, thinking about the decisions that we want, knowing more, making good choices in the present time. And hopefully at the end, if we want to have a peaceful death, we can have that. We can do it at home. We can be with our friends. But this is something scary to think about, but we can think about it and make plans for it. And for a lot of us, because of these chronic illnesses that won't just keep us immobilized, Sometimes our mind goes as well. How can we have these conversations earlier in life? And I think if we put all this together, we can make decisions that address our emotions, that address our relationships with our family, that help us live better today, and also help us have a happier and peaceful and agreeable death. Thank you.